Welcome to Circles Live. It's Monday night. I'm so glad that you are joining me from wherever you are and whoever you're watching with. You're welcome. This is a conversation that leads to transformation, not simply because you're hearing what we're talking about, but because you're going to engage in a conversation that's going to lead to action. It's only when we take action that transformation can truly take place. So I really hope that you're ready. I hope that you have got your notepad or your device ready to get down some notes because, of course, the idea of these conversations on a Monday night are for you to take into your circle groups, whether that's two of you, three of you, six of you, who meet together to discuss what's being talked about, to discuss the question that I'm going to give to you because that's what brings the subject alive in your life. When you take the principles of what we're talking about and you apply it to your own experience and you apply it to where you're headed in your life. I really believe that what we share in our circle sessions is highly practical and it's deeply transformational. So if you're ready, then let's go. Now, right now at the time of recording, we're at the height of a football tournament, just a small little tournament called the Euros. Now, if you're watching in America, you would have heard of the Euros, but right now you've got the Copa America, which is kind of like your version of the Euros. And of course, there are other uh, cups around the different continents. And of course, the big one is the World Cup in a couple of years' time. But at the height of this tournament, one of the big talking points, which to be honest has been a talking point throughout the whole of the last couple of Premier League seasons here in the UK, has been the use of VAR. I think it's Virtual Assisted Refereeing. I think that's what it stands for. But the whole idea of VAR was to use technology as a means of understanding what is the right decision or the wrong decision. Because football has always had those moments which have been debated for countless hours, some decisions for for years, even decades later, like the 1966 decision of did the ball cross the line when Sir Jeff Hurst scored his goal? Of course, the English were all like, yes, of course, it uh, crossed the line. And of course, the Germans, uh, West Germany it was at the time, uh, no, it didn't cross the line. And, and, And it's those debates, I guess, that VAR is supposed to try and resolve. But of course, the challenge has been the technology is so detailed now that you can you can find out what is the right decision from a snapshot and the detail might be right. But the problem now is we've got so much kind of correctness in terms of the technology. Now it's being challenged as to is it actually spoiling? the game of football because just because it hit his hand like does that actually influence the game in a in a advantageous way for the opposition and and yes you can tell now it's hit his hand because he's got this little chip in the ball and it gives this little shock wave which i think they're using cricket as well in other words we can prove that it it is a correct decision that it hit his hand or hit her hand but actually is that taking away from the whole point of the game of football. Is it actually advantageous or not? And and what's quite funny is the whole idea was it was introduced to try and improve the game by giving correct decisions. And I think it started to lead the other way where actually it's creating less enjoyment even though it's giving technically, scientifically correct decisions on any given moment. But what they're coming to understand is there's so much more to it than just a snapshot or a moment. There's a wider context. And, and, and does it actually... Let's get back to it. What is football? It's a game. It's a game for enjoyment. Like what's the point in, in having a game which, yes, every decision was made correctly, but actually none of us enjoyed it. <laughs> it you suddenly lose the why of what you're doing. Well, I want to come to the part of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes is where we are right now, 
where we're looking at what does it mean to be right and what does Jesus say about being right and and how important is being right and doing right in the kingdom of God. So I want us to get into this because this, I think, is going to be a really transformative discussion because I think it's going to connect with something that you and I experience on a regular basis, possibly even daily basis, but don't even really understand what's taking place inside. And I think it's going to be really empowering and enlightening and and we're going to be really inspired to actually start to take more control over what's happening internally because we're going to have some understanding as to what's taking place. Well, let's get into it. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down and his disciples came to him. And he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me stop there. We're going to be looking at verse 6. And I want to read verse 6 to you in the amplified version. This is what it says. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively seek right standing with God, for they will be completely satisfied. So we've got this verse, this segment of the Sermon on the Mount, Christ's manifesto. And Jesus is talking about how mankind can experience internal satisfaction and nourishment. That feeling of being fed and satisfied. And of course, this comes back to our analogy that we've been using, which of course has been around the picture of a buffet. Because Jesus here, and explicitly so, is talking about the hunger that we feel on the inside, the desires, the appetites, the wants that we have. And he leads us into an understanding as to how we satisfy those. And of course, we've been looking at the whole idea of never eating before a buffet. If you really want to maximize your buffet experience, then don't eat before you go to a buffet because you need to bring that appetite in all its fullness, ready to satisfy yourself with what is on offer. But of course, we've been looking at each of these different elements of the Sermon on the Mount and having a a little kind of strategic conversation as to the next time you're at a buffet, how you should act. And if you want the kind of strategy for verse 6 here, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, is this. If it feels good in an hour, choose to eat it now. If it feels good in an hour, choose to eat it now. Now, of course, the reason for that strategy, and it's an important strategy, is when you're looking at a buffet and you're looking at all that food, there's so much that looks nice. There's so much that you could eat. And of course, you're bringing your appetite and it's so easy just to try and fill the appetite without actually thinking about the long-term impact of what you're eating. But of course, there are things that we eat that actually in the moment they feel nice. But in 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour's time, you actually start to regret having chosen that food. So that's why the little strategic uh, uh, example here is if it feels good in an hour, choose to eat it now. You see, this is about making right decisions, not just taking what is nice from the buffet. 
we use the analogy of VAR, that actually it's about making the right decision. But where VAR's gone wrong? The right decision that satisfies, not just the right decision that leaves everybody feeling, yeah, but, you know, it's not enjoyable anymore. Jesus is talking about how to make the right decisions in our lives in a way that leads to satisfaction. When you go to a buffet to eat the things that are going to leave you feeling like, yeah, that was a good buffet, not, oh, I wish I'd never started. If it feels good in an hour, in other words, there's that, that long satisfaction. Yeah, that was a really satisfying meal. Then choose it now. In fact, I watched something quite recently where I think it's in Japan. Culturally, they have this rule that says once you're 80% full, you're full. <laughs> in other words, it's understanding that, yeah, your, your appetite could say, I could do another 20%. I mean, how many, let's be honest, how many of you have, have listened maybe once or maybe more times to that appetite and you allowed the appetite to tell you when it's full? Yeah, and then you regretted it. I've done it, so my hands and my legs are raised right now. But the Japanese, they're very, very wise. When you're 80% full, then you're full. In other words, it's, you've got to make sure that you, you tell your appetite what is good and what is Right. And of course, that's what Jesus here is saying. He's saying, you're blessed. You're, you're joyful. You're nourished by God's goodness when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's righteousness? Righteousness is the quality, this is the dictionary definition, the quality of being morally right. The quality of being morally right. Now, of course, this comes back to our VAR example. Who ultimately decides what is right? Because you can have the, the law that is set in place, which in football is set in place by human beings. And of course, human beings are imperfect. So it's never going to be perfect. We're never going to be totally satisfied when it comes to football. And let's face it, part of football is the fact that you've got to have something to complain about. That's part of the enjoyment. That's what people talk about the next day at work or they talk about online, on social media. You've got to have something to talk about. But when it comes to morally right, that can't be left to imperfect people to decide that. If it's left to imperfect people, then we are not going to be satisfied. If it's left to a perfect God, then we will be satisfied if we align ourselves to that God. And of course, God made flesh. Jesus Christ himself came to establish this very truth. Now, I want to look really practically here as to how this is going to impact our daily lives. Because maybe you're sat there, and I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. Maybe we've got people watching right now, and God for you is a, a distant being that maybe you believe is there, or question whether he's there or not, or don't believe that he's there. Or maybe you have a close relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But we've got to understand like, what is the daily reality that Jesus is speaking to right now. Because sometimes when we hear the word righteousness, we can think of, of, of a lofty idea, something that is far off and unobtainable. Because we all know that we're not perfect. We're, we all know that we uh, have mistakes, failures, littering our past. And so sometimes this idea of righteousness just seems out of reach. But remember, Jesus' manifesto is an empowering manifesto. It's not a manifesto rubbing our faces and our noses in something that we cannot experience. That would be cruel. It'd be cruel to say, yeah, this is my kingdom and this is, this is what it means to be in the kingdom, to be blessed and that blessed being a state of being blessed. But guys, you're never going to experience it because only I am perfect. I mean, that would be cruel. And of course, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, no, actually, you can experience this blessed state when you are hungry and thirsty 
for righteousness. When you seek that right standing with God, you are going to experience deep satisfaction. But we only see the virtue or the importance of something when we realize the problem that it's solving. So let us un- let's look at what unrighteousness actually means for us in our daily lives. Now we know, well, if we don't know, let me tell you this, uh, our uh, unrighteous state, in other words, our unholy state, having fallen short of God's standards, divides us from God. It prevents us from entering into a relationship with our Creator. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I'm going to assume those of you listening know that. But the good news is Jesus came to open the door for us to come back into relationship with a righteous God. And the way that he was going to do that was by creating the opportunity for us to be made righteous. Okay, God wasn't going to lower his standards, but God would give us Christ in order to enable, to empower us to become righteous in the sight of God, therefore giving us access. But what does unrighteousness actually look like and how does it impact us in our daily lives? Now, I like to think of righteousness as alignment. Alignment. When something is out of alignment, it is misaligned. And if you've ever driven a car where the wheels are out of alignment, Um, then you will know that it is not a comfortable ride. It is not a comfortable journey. In fact, if you've ever driven uh, and held a steering wheel, a car where one or more of the wheels are out of alignment, you will know that your, your wrist will start ache because you're constantly getting the pull of that misalignment because the wheels have to all be aligned in order for there to be a smooth journey misalignment creates a discomfort. Now, what does that discomfort look like for you? And what does that discomfort look like for me in my life? Now, there's a psychological term, because remember, we are spirit, soul, mind, and body. So anything that is of psychology is absolutely in the mix when it comes to how God has made us. But there's a psychological term called cognitive dissonance which is the discomfort that a person feels when their behavior is out of alignment with their values and their beliefs. So let me kind of give you an example of this because you and I will experience this uh, discomfort potentially on a daily basis. In fact, we will be to differing degrees based upon our level of self-awareness you know, depends on how much we we realize this or not. But when I start to share some of these things, you'll start to realize, ah, I have that problem, okay? I have the problem of cognitive dissonance. So some examples here. You want to be healthy. Let's go to the food uh, analogy. You want to be healthy, but you don't eat well and you don't exercise regularly enough. How many of us have ever experienced that dissonance? In other words, It's the discomfort between a desire, what you know to be good for you, eat right, exercise regularly, but what you actually do, eat rubbish, don't do enough exercise. Can you see there's misalignment between what is important and right to you and what you actually do. That creates discomfort. It creates a feeling of guilty. Okay. Another one might be in our finances. In fact, let's go around the different areas of our lives. So that's the health, finances. You'd like to build up savings. You know you've got to save up for something for someone, maybe for your children, maybe for your grandchildren. Maybe you know you've got to put a deposit down on a house to provide for your family. I don't know, but you've got to build up your savings. But the problem is every time it comes to payday, you get that little email that comes through from that favorite place where you shop. And it says, it's payday. And guess what? We've got deals that where there's 30% off. And, and you look at that and you think, wow, it would be rude not to. And of course, in that moment when you act and you buy the things maybe that you don't need and actually you haven't done what you know you want to do and is right to do, you feel discomfort. Regardless of how nice that garment is, every time you take that garment out of the wardrobe, there's an disease 
because it reminds you that you were out of alignment with what you believe to be right and true. Another area might be, you know, how we spend our time and our energy. So for instance, you know, you've got a, a lot of things that you've got to get done. Maybe you've been given a list of things from your employer. Maybe there's a list of things that you promised your wife or your husband to do. Maybe I'm making people feel guilty right now. And, and you, you, you know you've got a long list, but you start scrolling. You start scrolling on social media, and before you know it, you've gone into a series on Netflix, and then you've picked up on a, a YouTube clip that you thought was only going to be two minutes long, but now an hour has gone, and all of a sudden, you haven't got around to the things you know you should have done, or even you committed or promised to do. And then, of course, when they ask you, have you done those things? You're like, well, I've just been so busy. And actually, in that moment, a couple of things have happened. You've kind of bent the truth, which actually is lying. <laughs> and you've said that you're busy, but actually, you were lazy because you were doing the things you shouldn't have been doing. And listen, listen, I'm not here to condemn any of us because we've all done those things where we have fallen short of our own standards. And that is cognitive dissonance. Another form of, 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 of cognitive dissonance is when we have options and we overanalyze options and we overplay the importance of getting the option wrong and, and we're caught by the paralysis of analysis and there's that discomfort. We're out of alignment. We're pulled one way, then we're pulled the other. Listen, that's not the life that God has for you. That's not the life that God has for me. There is to be a state of joy and that state of internal spiritual satisfaction and fulfillment which is why Jesus said blessed because that's what blessed is it's to be fulfilled content in a state of internal and inner joy but out of that state it, it comes the right behavior the right attitude we start to make good choices and good decisions. And Jesus here is saying, he's saying, you are going to be nourished by goodness when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, to correctly align yourself to me. So in the moment when we're not sure whether what the choices that we have before us, are, are going to be good for us or not. Our desire is to seek God. God, what do you think about this? Just as I said, if it feels good in an hour, eat it now. It's almost like saying, well, God, does this feel good to you? Does this choice feel good to you? You see, that's what prayer is. Prayer is a, an open conversation with God where we bring our questions to him. And sometimes God doesn't give us answers. Sometimes he gives us more questions. But the whole point is he's, that prayer brings alignment. Prayer brings alignment. And, and, and when we have that alignment, that's when we feel nourished. That's when we feel joyful. When we actually start making those decisions and choices aligned to what God wants for our lives. Because righteousness it was a set of principles that gives us an understanding of his way of doing things and his way of doing right and being right. His righteousness is the, the attitude. It's the character of God. We are made in the image of God. And we have to remember this, that when in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it records that in his image, in our image, God says, in our likeness, let us make man. God was invisible. So we're not talking about a physical image that God made us in. God made us in the image of his character. Character is a, a set of values and principles that are the essence, the ingredients that make up who he is. And he has poured into mankind, his creation, that character. That is the image. And whenever you and I act out of alignment 
with those values and those principles, we feel it. Now, again, re regardless of, of where we are in our relationship with him, we will feel it. We'll feel the dis-ease, the discomfort. We may not see it as unrighteousness, but that's what it is. It is out of alignment. And God doesn't want you to be living in dis-ease and discomfort. He doesn't want you to be living uh, with that, that, that misalignment. He wants you to experience life and life in all its fullness. He wants you to experience the state of being blessed. And Matthew 6, 33, of course, where Jesus says, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. The Amplified Version says this, but first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God. And all these things will be given to you also. Wow. He, he makes it simple. He simplifies everything. Life becomes so uncomfortable and, 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 and we feel the stress of life when we are out of alignment. We feel that internal discomfort when our beliefs are not his beliefs about us. When our assumptions rule his conclusions about how much he loves us and values us. And I want to give us a question right now because we need to start to deal with this discomfort and this dis-ease. We need to deal with this unrighteous state that we keep defaulting back to because when you have received Christ, you have received the righteousness of God. You, you, in fact, we are made the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Listen to this. You are blessed when you actively seek to align the image of who you were created to be with who you're becoming. In other words, every decision and choice and action that you take from this moment on is about who you're becoming. But I need to align that to the image of who he's created me to be. Who has he created me to be? I am made in his image, his character. How do I know what that is and what it looks like? That's where this comes in. This is where God is revealed. The word of God reveals the nature of God. This becomes our mirror. This becomes the means by which we can align our lives to how God sees us. That's how we get to enjoy the game of life once again, rather than being left to man's opinion as to what is correct and what is right, what is moral, what is immoral, what is ethical, what is unethical. What does God have to say? I want to give you a question to discuss in your groups. And this is the discussion question. Are you experiencing internal discomfort? If so, and let me be honest with you, that's in some area of your life you're going to be, because we all are. What is out of alignment? What belief needs to change? What belief needs adding? What belief needs to be taken captive? In other words, to be removed. So I want you to discuss with those that you're on this journey with, what is that internal discomfort that you're experiencing, which is uh, unrighteousness? And let's start to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Let's get hungry for more of the right things. Let's seek out who God is. The more we look at the nature and character of God, the more we'll see gaps between who he is and who, who we have been. But that's okay because... We don't have to earn his acceptance. We have received his acceptance through Christ. In other words, we have been made the righteousness of Christ. And that means that that is our potential. So it's, this is an empowering message because any gap that you find through Christ, you can close that gap.
You can close that gap. You can start making the right choices that bring alignment. And you know what? There's nothing like being in alignment to being in that state of fulfillment and satisfaction and nourishment and goodness and that satisfaction, that complete satisfaction that God has for you. But we've got to commit ourselves to alignment. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively seek right standing with God, for they will be completely, completely satisfied. Listen, I hope this has challenged you. I hope it's encouraged you. It has done me. Listen, we're on this journey together. We're a work in progress, but let's keep up the momentum with our conversations. Let's be brutally honest when we meet and let's be really open. Let's deal with that internal world because the outside world needs right now you to be who God has called you to be, to be in alignment so you can be a light, you can be salt to help this world see what they're missing out on, which is the kingdom of heaven. Listen, remember today and every day you are a champion and there's more in you than you think. Until next time, take care.